This is a huge purchase that values Next at five and a half billion dollars. There's been some hesitation among exchange operators to pursue these big cross-border deals. Tell us why now is the right time for CME to make this move. Well, first, Scarlett, thank you for having me on. I need to correct Sherry a little bit. She said that we were rivals with Next, that we were acquiring our rival. We're not a rival with Next. We're complementary in nature. And when you look at cross-border transactions, to go to your question, Scarlett, you know, I've always said that cross-border exchange transactions are very, very difficult to do. So when you look at the London Stock Exchange or the, uh, the, the German exchange, Deutsche Borsa, you know, they become these nationalistic type of platforms in these countries. Next is not in the same category as an exchange where it trades listed companies in a particular jurisdiction for trade. Um, they are platforms to trade for uh, foreign exchange cash with their EBS platform and they trade uh, broker tech on their interest rate platform and then they have uh, optimization services as Triana for their FX and Trioptima which is a compression services that does a bunch of back office services that makes the markets much more efficient. So when you look at what we have here at CME Group and you take the EBS platform and you look at CME's uh, foreign exchange platform and you put those together and take the best of breed of both Next and CME, you, you allow participants to trade more. Roughly today we have about 900 billion each mm -hmm. in notional value of trade in foreign exchange where the market's worth 5 trillion. And then obviously on the uh, interest rate, the broker tech cash and the CME futures yes. we think is very attractive for the participants. And I want to get to that, especially with uh, Treasuries, because this deal gives you the control of most trading in uh, the Treasuries market and Treasury futures as well. So what does that mean for the market, that market right now, especially as we're in the late stage of a market cycle and you've got the Federal Reserve raising interest rates, winding down its balance sheet, we've got the budget deficit growing. What does that tell us? It tells us a lot, Scarlett, because you, you just hit the nail on the head when you said that the Federal Reserve is winding down its balance sheet. If the Federal Reserve is winding down its balance sheet, and here in the United States we have one of the few Feds or the central banks that do not hedge their balance sheet, the other participants are going to need to step up and take on that debt. They do need to hedge. So that's where we think that we are very strongly suited in order to help mitigate that risk for those participants. And when you look at the cash platforms, it's no different. So people trading the cash, people trading the futures, they're complementary in nature. They both are going to need to hedge that in uh, the exposures they have today, and especially in fixed income. So we talk about the benefits of this control you now have uh, in Treasury's market. Is there a risk as well to, to this dominance? You know, Scarlett, I would say absolutely not. We know our percentage of trade in the Treasury market was around 44 percent just a few years back. We're up around 90 percent of the trade today in, in the U.S. Treasury market. So we mitigated and migrated, I guess is a better word, a, m a bunch of that business to our platform today. It's a very efficient platform and it continues to go there. You know as well as I do, Scarlett, liquidity likes to go to, the, to, the, to a centralized place where it's most efficient and that's what our futures contracts have done. Now when you look at Nexus platform, we're going to keep the exact same structure they have today with Nexus and their participants, but you put it on a platform together where they can trade both the cash and the futures. We think it's very attractive for the participants. And Terry, just going back to that cross-barter uh, issue for a moment here, do you think that might present a challenge on the regulatory front? You know, I will tell you, Scarlett, that you know I don't bring many deals to my board. Obviously, the last one I brought was in 2008 when we acquired the New York Mercantile Exchange. So, and before that, it was the Chicago Board of Trade in 2007. So, it's been 10 years since we've done a major transaction. I make sure that when we bring things, we're, we're very professionally advised by inside and outside counsel. We feel confident that we have uh, very complementary uh, products to, mm. to put together that will benefit the clients. And so, we will wait and go through the processes, but uh, we're hoping this will go. Uh, through the processes and we'll be able to close in the fourth quarter of this year. In other words, you've done your due diligence, Terry. Uh, this is a cash and stock deal. One analyst says the cash component does leave the door open for a rival bid to come in. Do you expect a rival bid? You know, it's, it's hard for me to anticipate or predict, Scarlett, if there will be a rival bid. You know, um, when I look at the efficiencies that I've already outlined for you, I, I think that's going to be a very compelling for the users and uh, you know it's going to be very difficult for others to come in here we have not heard any rumblings as of yet mm -hmm. doesn't mean they won't come in I'm sure people will wait and see the price which they saw today there was speculation on what the price may or may not be in the last couple of days as you know but now they've seen it so we'll have to wait and see.
Um, next, CEO Michael Spencer's role will that will be that he'll join the board of directors over at the CME, and he'll also serve as a special advisor, capital S, capital A. What does that mean in practical terms? Uh, how long will he be there for this transition, for the integration? Well, Michael is very important to the, the future of the next businesses as we integrate them into CME Group. So when I originally met with Michael, I said it was important for him to stay on with the organization, you know, the, to be an ambassador, to be somebody that could help integrate these businesses. No one knows him better than Michael. So he has committed to do so. Michael has publicly said that, you know, obviously he's taken 50% in cash, 50% in stock. He anticipates holding his stock. He uh, wants to be a very happy CME Group shareholder, and he will help us integrate this business. That, that's a big part of it, Scarlett. Mm. So uh, I'm excited to have Michael as a part of it uh, going forward. He has a lot of these relationships, especially on the broker tech and the uh, optimization businesses. So he'll be a very big part of this. Terry, before we let you go, I need to ask you, in the yep. context of your career, this is a huge deal and it really cements your position mm. in the exchange world. People forget that you got your start at the CME kind of at the bottom, you're a part-time bartender. How did you get your start in trading? I just want you to recount for us here. <laughs> well, you know, I, it was many years ago, Scarlett, but you're right, I didn't come from a whole bunch, so I, I was. I started as a runner here at the exchange. I was tending bar uh, when I was in college and I met a, a gentleman who thought I'd be good in his business and he brought me down. I got a job for $56 a week in 1980. I absolutely fell in love with it and I never left. And I, I started my trading career in 1981 and then went through the progression of a, a mutual company, mutual exchange, and then I was fortunate enough to become chairman of the company in 02, take it public, and you know the rest is history, and I'm sitting here talking to you today. So that's the fast forward version. Fast forward that's the live TV version, I should say, Scarlett. <laughs>